right so this is super interesting again like we were talking about before um i heard about you from i was he your previous sj is that what he was in that office uh, yeah, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Gettin is, I believe he's still Lieutenant Colonel. Um, he was my SJA for eight years before I transferred to the Alabama National Guard. Okay. Yes. Good he's so I, Yep. So I heard, so I was mentioning something about the paralegal podcast and, you know, I think his antennas were like, huh, so if you're doing that, yeah. I know someone that you can reach out to. Uh, you know to talk to about you know an interesting you know definitely an interesting situation and to me i found it when he told me about you and then i i looked you up on roster i found it extremely interesting as well just everything that you're involved in everything that you're doing and, and how you're progressing uh, yeah, the Air Force uh, yeah. Guard, so. absolutely thank you so i'm like all right so let's reach out i got sergeant quinto it's like we have to reach out to her and i know he kind of I'll, I'll send you an email initially to kind of confirm your interest and here we are yeah no i i really like things like this too because i feel like paralegals in the air force whether it's reserve guard or the duty i mean we we really do need to be able to hear different perspectives from different um news of the Air Force. There's so many options for us. I mean, even if you don't want to be active duty anymore, or you know, you've done active duty for a while, you're ready to move on to something else. I, if you haven't hit your 20 years, or even if you have, I mean, the guard is always an option. And I don't think that people realize that and as guardsmen, typically we end up informing active duty people who are thinking about getting out after, you know, one or two enlistments. Why don't you just transfer over to the guard? I mean, my parents did it, all three of them, stepdad included. I mean, they got out of active duty and transitioned into the guard and and, and there's so many options there instead of just getting out completely. So, yeah. All right, you no, know, that's really good. I think you're the first person that, that I have on the podcast from either the guard or the reserve. So, so that's really cool that you'll bring that perspective as well. Yeah, um, for sure. So let's start with just some introduction. Yeah, just tell uh, tell us who you are, um, a little bit of background. Yeah, so um, my name is J.P. Fisher. I enlisted as a paralegal in 2012, and I recently commissioned last weekend as a lieutenant, a first lieutenant, and I'll be going to OTS and JSOC between the end of this year and early next year. Um, but I graduated with my bachelor's before enlisting, which I know is unusual, um, but it was one of those situations I had psychology degree, i.e. basket weaving, as, as people like to say, unless you're going to go to school for seven more years. And I really didn't know what I wanted to do in psychology. So I moved back home and started, you know, slinging sushi at the hibachi restaurant. Mm. And I remember one morning my mom woke me up and was like, look, you know, you can't sling sushi forever. You're going to have to join the military or do something. Um, join the guard. Just, I encourage you to join the guard. And so at the time, and this is still true, in Illinois, they will pay 100% of any in-state tuition for four years if you join the Air National Guard. And so that was a no brainer for me. Um, I knew that law school was gonna be very expensive and I had been thinking about either going to get a master's or going to law school. And so for a year of enlisting, they pay 100% plus you get your GI Bill stipend. So, I mean, that's a deal. And not every state does that, but in Illinois, that's what they do. So we went to meet with the recruiter. My parents were prior guardsmen and active duty. They knew what questions to ask. An over slot in paralegal was created for me after I interviewed with the unit. And that was it. And, and so anyway, that's how I ended up in paralegal. But um, sure enough, they did pay 100% of my law school. I finished law school in two and a half years. So I still had years, I still have years left over that I could use at um, an in-state school. 
but I'm never going to school again and you could not pay me to do so. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I just got them. But I mean, you know, they paid for all of my law school tuition. Um, and I've been practicing for a little over four years now as an attorney. I'm licensed in Missouri and Alabama. And in 2020, early 2020, I transferred from the Illinois Air National Guard to the Alabama Air National Guard. And it was a seamless transition. They needed a paralegal. I needed to move to Alabama because my husband and I um, had just got married and we were living in Alabama at the time. And um, I transitioned over. And then the conversation came up from my leadership at Alabama Guard that they needed to start transitioning a JAG into a JAG position at the legal office because, you know, the SJA eventually moves on up and either goes elsewhere or becomes the state JAG. And so they were preparing for that. It was at that time that the opportunity presented itself for me to commission. And so I went through the lengthy commissioning package uh, process and um, I was eventually selected actually very quickly, surprisingly. Um, and then I commissioned last weekend. So all is well, but that's kind of my story <laughs> from beginning to now. Wow. Yeah, no, that's yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah that, that's really cool. And we'll kind of break it down a little bit, but um, yeah, that's, that's incredible. And especially if you're one of those states like Illinois, is I, Maybe not all states, but may, there may be more than just Illinois that does the same thing as far as paying 100% tuition. I'm sure there is. I'm, I'm sure that there is. Um, and I don't know, each. I probably should have looked that up because that would have been interesting to know, but each and every state is different. I know Alabama is not 100%. Um, the other thing is in Illinois, they pay up front. So they'll actually pay your tuition up front through the school Whereas in Alabama, you pay up front and they reimburse mm. you some or most of it, up to a certain amount. It's not necessarily 100% tuition, but you do get, you know, a little bit of stipend as well. So anyway, I know there's more states that do that, but people do need to know that because when you're in the guard, in active duty, yes, you can go to school. Absolutely. You can do night school. Um, there's so many opportunities to do online school these days. But in the Guard, I was able to go full time and do the accelerated program to graduate law school in just two and a half years or, you know, any master's program you wanted to do or bachelor's program and still meet my commitment in the Guard and, and still be in the service and receive all the same benefits for the most part. So um, I just, you know, I, I do think it's important for people to know, like, there's so many benefits to being in the guard and I'm not trying to convince anybody to leave active duty, but I'm just saying, you know, there's, there's so many options to serve in the air force, um, that aren't just active duty. Right. No, 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 absolutely. And I know for me personally, um, if I had known a little bit earlier, maybe that's the route that I would have taken, but, uh, it's too late for me now. Um, that's, that's all right. Good. That's all right. That's good. Now we just kind of, you know, let others because other people. You're right. They may be thinking about getting out, and that's okay. Yeah. But you don't have to do, you know, full get out. There's always other options, and that's always uh, always good to explore and, and to and to get smart with. Um, okay, so you are from Illinois, then, right? You that's. Yes. Yeah, that's where I'm from. Um, I went to college and undergrad in Louisiana, and then that's when I moved back in with my parents in Illinois. And I was at Scott Air Force Base. They live in Oak Allen, which is uh, right around the corner from Scott. And so um, I was at the 126th Air Refueling Wing, and then I moved to Alabama in 2018. But I was still drilling in Illinois because I... The weird thing about the Guard, and, and the good thing about the Guard, is, I mean, you're with these people potentially for, like, 20 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you could be with the same office for a very, very long time if no one cross trains or commissions or, get, you know, gets out. And so I had been with the same office for all eight years. I mean, we were, like, family, click tight. So 
it was very difficult for me to look to transition to another unit before I actually moved and while I had moved um, because I just was so close to Lieutenant Colonel Getton and now Lieutenant Downs, who at the time was my law office supervisor. She was a paralegal that commissioned um, and Major Donato Latrofa. I mean, we were all very, very, very close uh, as a legal office. And so I stayed there for over a year, just flying back and forth for drill. <laughs> wow. And that's every two weeks? You know, I, no, once a month. Oh, once a month. But, you know, I would fly back once a month and go do my drill days. And I would also visit my family while I was there. But, um, you know, when you like the people you work with, it's hard to leave. And we had a very positive culture there. They were great mentors to me. They saw me through law school. They wrote so many letters of recommendation for me. They saw me through my first two years of practice as an attorney. I mean, you know, so um, that's the other interesting thing about the guard is you really do become like family. And so it was difficult for me to leave. But when I transitioned into Birmingham, 117th era fueling wing, they opened, they took me in with open arms and they provided excellent mentorship and leadership, taught me about things like retirement points, things I had never actually heard of, um, and taught me like, look, you can do more than two weeks of annual training in the guard, you know, you technically you can do 30 days. There's ways around doing just the two weeks and you'll get more retirement points and just all of these things that I wish I would have known nine years ago. Um, so I've just been really blessed and lucky to have been at two really awesome units and legal offices. That's really good. And um, it's interesting you mentioned Major Latrofa because I know him. I, yeah. <laughs> I knew him as a baby jag. He was at Lachlan and I was a, I was a paralegal <laughs> there. So for a brief time, he was my adverse actions, my chief of adverse actions. So yeah. Cool. So he, he actually joined the guard and, and so yes, lived in Chicago or still lives in Chicago, I guess. And, um, it's going to be the SJA at 126, but he joined us. I want to say like, Gosh, probably five or six years ago, maybe. Um, and with trans, you know, making that transition into the guard is different. I mean, it's it's totally different than active duty. I mean, it really, really is. And so, anyway, we all just became really close over time, the four of us. And um, and then the office kind of just dispersed around the same time. So we all kind of decided to leave around the same time, except for for him. Obviously, he he will be promoting into the SGA spot, but. Yeah, the guard is just so different that the dynamics are are very different, I think, than active duty, yeah. from what I can tell. Right. No, that's really cool um, that you get to know people in that, you know, like that. And like you said, active duty, we're changing all the time, all the time. But then you could potentially be 20 years uh, working with the same individuals for that, you know, for that long. Um, I'm a little so I'm. Interested in what you said about it. So in 2012, you joined as a paralegal and that you knew that you were going to be a paralegal before you joined. So how did that all happen? How, how was that? How were you able to get that? So oh, the guard is so different, again, in that you kind of know what job you're going to be in before you go to basic training. So when you go to the recruiter, you find out what job slots are open and they tell you, you know, this slot is open at God or whatever. And you kind of get to sign up for that spot before you leave. And you actually interview with the unit before anything, before you even go to basic training. And so I interviewed with the legal office before I went to basic training, like before I ever had any real job ever. I had interviewed with the legal office there at, and at the time at the guard um, unit at the guard unit okay. in Illinois. And at the time she's now retired chief master sergeant, Robin Warner. She was the loss at the 126. She was a master sergeant at the time. And she, and I believe it was major may who was the SJA at the time did my interview. And so once they pick you, 
whether you're off the street or already in about to con uh, cross train, they're the ones who tell the recruiter, yes, we want her. And then the recruiter goes ahead and does his job to get you in, get you through basic, get you through tech school, get you through seasoning days. And at that point, you start at the unit. But typically, and especially in paralegal, you know what your job is before you actually go to basic training. I mean, and you know, you've taken your ASVAB by then. They know that your score's high enough to be in this AFSC. And I mean, you, you just know where you're going to be and what you're going to be doing before you ever even go off to basic training. <clears throat> yeah, that's really good. And I kind I want to say that I somewhat knew that. Um, <laughs> but not many people know about the paralegal career field in the Air Force or even in the, you know, in the armed forces. So did you know that the paralegal, were you doing some research? You know, did, how did you come across the, you know, the paralegal field? Yes. So what happened was I had this psychology degree and I knew I I didn't know I, I didn't want to be a psychologist, but I knew I didn't want to go to school for like seven more years. Like that was not an option for me. Um, and I started realizing like, oh, I really don't want to like listen to people's problems all day, which is ironic because Sometimes as a paralegal, that's what you do. And certainly as an attorney, that's what you do. <laughs> Except really advo you know, advocating for their life, liberty, and property also, which is also much more stressful. But anyway, I didn't know anything at the time. I was 21 and, you know, blue in the face. But anyway, so I, um, I did what most lawyers do, honestly, which is, I don't know what I want to do with my life. I'll go to law school. And so that's kind of what happened. And so I knew I wanted to go to law school before I became a paralegal. Um, but when I went to the recruiter, there was actually not a slot open for paralegal at the unit I wanted to go to. What happened was um, you can create overages, like the, the units allowed a certain amount of overages in each office for anticipated movement, you know, like when the, the a loss is expected to go become a senior, you know, because in the paralegal field, becoming a senior master sergeant, you you got to do some movement. You're not going to be able to sit in the same office. Um, and same thing with chief. So when there's an anticipated movement, which for Master Sergeant Warner at the time there was, they'll start filling in overages. And that's what happened to me. And so they made me a slot, so to speak. And the reason I knew about paralegal was because I said, look, I want to go to law school. Um, is there anything personnel or anything that would be remotely close to what I'm trying to do ultimately? And they said paralegal, but, you know, they were like, but there's no slots. And so I did have to do a little maneuvering and calling around and really taking the initiative to be like, is there any way that y'all can make an overage? And as soon as I found out that an overage was an option, I jumped on that. So, yeah, that, that's how I knew about it. And my mom worked for the state. Both of my parents worked for the state also. Um, and we're both prior military. And actually, now that I remember, my dad, my biological dad, was a paralegal in the Illinois Air National Guard, excuse me, active duty at Chanute in oh, wow. Champaign way back in the day before it closed down. And so wow. actually, I think that is how I actually found out about it was because in the 80s, he served as a, a paralegal at Chanute. And so um, I think that's how I knew it existed. But everything else, as far as the overage and stuff, was just kind of like me asking 101 questions. Because, you know, sometimes you just got to like put yourself out there like, look, that's what I'm trying to do. And honestly, I'll be completely transparent. I felt like, I don't have to join the guard. I mean, that's, that's how I felt about it at the time. I mean, it's the best decision I've ever made. Really, it truly, truly is in hindsight. But at the time, I was like, look, I mean, I need a stable job, stable benefits. And if y'all can't find an, an over for paralegal, like, I wasn't going to join. I mean, that's full disclosure. And, and I'm not ashamed to say that. Um, and so they, they found the slot. <laughs> <laughs> that's really good so I, yeah no i'm curious about how you learned about it because when i talk to people and through the podcast and i, I talk to young airmen and people that come in and every one of them you know it's just 
they join in open general, kind of yeah. risking to see what it is that they get, but they had no idea that paralegal even existed, that paralegal was even an option. So they learn about that in basic training. And that's yeah. where, you know, that's where they're like, oh yeah, I'll try, you know, I'll give that a try, but it's not like they already kind of know ahead of time uh, that that's an option. But now I'm not sure if you knew, um, but now they're changing it a little bit where you can actually come in with a paralegal as a guaranteed job in active duty. Wow. So they've changed that. Yeah, they've changed that. And That's I believe amazing. they've already had a few. I'm not really sure on that. So don't quote me. And I don't want them to get mad at me if I get that wrong. But <laughs> I believe that uh, that they've already, you know, this year, that's when that started. Either last year or this year is when it started. Um, that for active duty, you can come in. The thing is, with, I don't know if we are doing a good job advertising that so that many people know it's still only, you know, if you do your research or if you just find it in basic training as an open journal, like, all right, sure, I'll do that. Yeah, that's that's really cool, though. And I think we should do that because, I mean, we need paralegals and we need good paralegals. Like, let's be honest. I mean, I always say this. And I think having been a paralegal for so long, it means more to me than it does to most attorneys. But like paralegals are the heart of any law firm, any law office. And if they're without good paralegals, I mean, the office just doesn't run. It just doesn't. And that's in civilian, military, whatever. I mean, a grave issue can come up if a paralegal um, is not there or makes a mistake. And so I don't know. I just... I think that we need to be like pushing for people to join this career field because it's so important. And also this, this is one of those skills that translates into the civilian mm -hmm. sector. So if you're looking at getting out, even if you're retiring and you're still young, which young is anything under 80 <laughs> these days. Um, I mean, you know, you can always translate that into the civilian career field and make a lot of money. I mean, there there's options out there to make good money in good cities as a paralegal. So for sure. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And the thing is, and, and that's where I think, you know, and that's where we're failing, I think, is that there's a lot of people out there that they go to school to be a paralegal, right? You you go to school, you get bachelor's degree. There's yeah. even mass I, I saw I have master's degrees um for paralegal. And if we get those, yeah. you know, so if those individuals are struggling and they want to come in and they want to be a paralegal, then we're going to get more out of them instead of someone who just, you know, even though they go through the interview, but they're kind of like, you know, they didn't really want this. They just were avoiding security forces, right? They're like, well, I don't want to be security forces. So yeah, sure. I would take paralegal, but it's still not something that they want to do. Um, whereas, Thanks. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. I mean, for real, like you're speaking the truth. Like there's tons of people that are like, I'm trying to get out of services and, and security forces. Like I'll just be a parent. Yeah, I'll take whatever. And, yeah. And you do have to have some, what of an interest in this career field to do this career, because let's be honest, like even as a guardsman, I know after, you know, having done quad tours and AT days and seasoning days, like paralegal is a very stressful position. I don't know how it is compared to being a JAG, but I do know that even as, as, an, as a civilian attorney for the last four and some years, our paralegals definitely have probably more work than we do as attorneys. I mean, you know, we have the ability to, yeah, every once in a while we're drafting like a really complex brief or something and showing up to advocate orally. But I mean, you know, paralegals are doing the ugly work behind the scenes. And in the military, and I always tell people this, I'm like, it's so different in the military because paralegals actually do most of the drafting period. And that includes legal reviews, briefs, things like that. In the civilian world, that is not the case. And so, um, you know, they may draft like a civilian paralegal may draft discovery or like a very basic motion. But I mean, when you go to seven levels and for paralegal in the Air Force, I mean, the writing is complex. Is. The writing is like an associate attorney's job title, job duties, I would say, in my opinion. So, I mean, you know, I just think it's like we get invaluable experience right. as Air Force paralegals that people have to realize, like, 
you're going to have so much experience to take into the mm -hmm. civilian world if you decide to do that or to continue in the Air Force world. And I don't know, you, you've got to kind of like it. Mm -hmm. You kind of do, because if, if you don't, you're going to get burnt down real, real quick and, and burnt out and exhausted and your mental health will probably break down very quickly if you don't have some type of interest in this career field. So I don't know. I, I think it would be better for people to like be able to research that beforehand because you're right. Like, do we really want like people that like feel like they're just leftovers? I mean, I don't know. I, you gotta have an interest for sure. Right. And you're right. You either get burned out or you're useless really because work yeah. doesn't, come to you like as a paralegal it's not like you know security forces are like man they get and i'm not saying that i'm not saying that to undermine that the career field is super right. important but you're really told everything that you need to do in maintenance you're told what you need to like here's the you know here's the technical order you know and you know exactly and, and the work is given to you like you you don't have to really like go look for work because it's it's given to you and yeah as a paralegal you to be you know, a good paralegal, you have to know, like, so here's this case. Now you got to figure out what's next and what's the next step and do some research and get into the AFI. It's not like, oh, I'm asking this question, but the question that you're asking, I'm going to have to get into the AFI anyways. Yeah. So you have to, you know, you have to do a lot of things on your own that is necessarily not, you know, people are not telling you to do. And if you're not good at doing that, then people are simply not going to give you work and they're going to take that case away. It might be good for you yeah. if you don't want to do anything, but you're not helping the team. For EPRs either, right? Like, let's be honest. Like, the more you accomplish, yeah, you know, that you do well, the more work you get, and that's, you know. But you do need those EPR bullets. And, again, you know, if you're interested in it, you may enjoy doing certain types of cases in criminal justice. And I, I think that, or military justice, I think that, over time, maybe also it becomes more enjoyable because I'll be completely frank. Like I was ready to get out at my six year mark. I was ready to get out the day I was supposed to separate. Uh, my JAG family pulled me in the room in an office and was like, don't do this. Like, I just be more for you. You're going to regret this later stick it out at least one more enlistment because it, it gets better. Like that first, you know, six years is like, you're still trying to just figure out what you want in life in general, not just in your career, but just in life in general. And if you stick with this, you could potentially love this. And also I think that they thought that eventually I would want to commission because I didn't want to commission for a long time. I really just enjoyed being a paralegal. So, um, Anyway, I, I decided to stay in and now I'm just so thankful that I did even before the commissioning opportunity came about because I really enjoy ultimately being a paralegal. Like I really, really enjoyed that job. And it was kind of a nice break from my civilian practice as well, only because we do general practice and I do pretty, you know, high complex litigation. And so it was really nice to be able to like sit down and bust out four legal reviews you know, or like some wills and powers of attorney. Like I appreciated it so much more when I actually got into the weeds of practicing law. So I don't know. I just, I think that, it, that the useless thing is real. Like we do all know a paralegal that they just don't give the work to, but they're like, I mean, you know, it's not like I can necessarily kick them out, but I don't really like the way they work and they don't want to be here. And some of them will just tell you, I don't want to be here. Right. And sometimes you do have to change your attitude. It's not an easy job. It's certainly like a heavy life, the crown job. People think it's, you know, peas and carrots and it's not, it's a lot of stress. There's a lot of vicarious trauma in the paralegal career field uh, and in legal in general. You know, if you change your mindset and realize that, like, this is one of the most important career fields in AFSCs, I think, um, I mean, your people's lives are really, truly in your hands in a lot of different ways, whether it's gen law or military justice. So 
I don't know. It's, it's important for sure. Yeah, we can't. So the mission, right? We complain so much. And this is something that I brief uh, ALS and senior NCOs. Whenever I get an opportunity, I brief that, you know, we have people under investigation for so long, right? Um, and that's individuals that they can't, the unit can't find a replacement for because they can't, right? They're still going to be in their unit manning document. Um, on their investigation, you have to take them away from their job, from the regular duty, because, you know, they can't be right next to, you know, with the victim or whoever else in the unit. So just, you know, how you have to, you have to like the career field, this career field to do it. I mean, it's not just like a, you hate security forces, so I'll just go be a paralegal because you might hate this too. I mean, <laughs> it just depends. Um, but you, you've got to have some type of interest in helping people in the law. Things like that, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you gotta, you have to be self-driven and have some sort of, you know, initiative and motivation. You can't just wait for things to come. Just Absolutely. won't really be that good. And well, yeah. it happens. It happens. And, and But some offices are not going to run as smooth as, as other offices will when you don't have that, right? Um, and mentoring, you know, it's always there. It's, and that's why we senior NCOs and, and hopefully officers are there to do. Sometimes officers, and, and I understand, attorneys are super busy, um, you know, with cases and feeling, especially when you have paralegals that are not pulling their weight, that means that attorneys have to do a lot more. So they don't have time to try to mentor a paralegal. And be like, hey, you know, have all that patience that it requires because everything's moving. Everything's moving. So that's why I think, you know, we're so important to as senior NCOs and supervisors um, in trying to get that mentality in there. But if it's not there, there's really not much we can do. I agree. I agree. But I mean, you bring up a great point, too. There is something to be said about officers and senior enlisted investing in their paralegals because again had mine not pulled me aside and said you are making a mistake if you get out today i don't know well i certainly wouldn't be where i am today but also i don't know that i would have grown to love the paralegal career field as much as as i do so they do have a responsibility in my opinion um, to provide that mentorship and leadership. And, and again, I know the active duty culture is kind of different because it's such a limited amount of time that you may be with your office, but it only takes a little amount of time to make a, a difference in a young paralegal's life or a, a young A1C or C, senior airman's life. And I mean, you, you do always have to be thinking about the next generation of, of Air Force. And so I think they do have a responsibility to do like Major Davis at my unit has done and, and said, listen, y'all need to get as many retirement points as possible so you can have a big check at retirement. You know, you need some duty points. You need to be maxing out your days. I mean, that's the kind of thing that I wish somebody would have told me nine years ago, because it gives you an incentive to do more than just do your two days of drill per month and then get out. I mean, that provided a significant incentive for me to say, look, I'm going to have to do some, some extra days throughout the month. And I do like tomorrow, I'm doing two, two days on Thursday and Friday. Every once in a while, I'll do two to three days during the week, because I know about that now. And I had someone who was like, look, this is a thrift savings plan, you get this 5% match, here's, this, you know, these retirement points. I mean, the leadership really does have a responsibility to make us feel like there's more purpose to this career field and more purpose to serving. You know, it's not just wearing the uniform and just the benefits, you know, of, of being in the Air Force, but also, I mean, again, there's significant skills you learn for outside of the Air Force. And also, I mean, we have a, a wonderful opportunity to, to make money after we get out. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, I would have liked to know about, know, you know, about that early on. So. Right. No, absolutely. Anyway. And I think it, it just requires, you know, when a mentoring and leadership part, it just requires a lot of patience. And 
I know not all of us always have the patience, right? Because we're moving so fast. And but that's the biggest thing is the patience. Because we we can definitely explain to someone who's not that invested in what they do or in the mission. You can explain, hey, this is how important you know this is. And if you can get smart on all these different things and get familiar with these things and help the attorney in this way, then it's going to make us that much better, like, right? And if you can have that and people internalize it. Um, I think it will go somewhere, but it just requires so much patience and, and mm -hmm. sitting down with a person. Yeah, it's not easy. It does. And and again, I mean, you know, you're in senior leadership. You know how it is where also there's there's a point where I can train you so many times and I can explain this again and again so many times. But at some point, as you mentioned earlier, like the paralegal has to have the initiative to say, Okay, I'm, you know, I'm going to write all of this down so I don't forget next time. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I'm going to correct this error. I'm going to have more attention to detail. This is definitely a career field that requires a tremendous amount of attention to detail, whether you're active duty reserve or guard. And you do have to take responsibility for, you know, wanting to improve, being teachable, which is like the most important uh, attribute I think a paralegal can have is, is to be teachable and, and be open to learning something new every single day. Because a lot of the time you're going to learn something new each and every week or day um, because every case is so fact specific and so different. So I don't know. I agree. There, there's definitely got to be a balance. Um, but in this career field, whether you're going to go guard or active duty, you got to have that attention to detail, that yearning to learn and to be teachable and understand the role that you play mm -hmm. in because it's a, it's a significant role. I mean, some people think, oh, I don't want to be a paralegal forever. I want to do something else. There's tons of people who make excellent careers out of being a paralegal their their whole career because it's it's a necessary position lawyers cannot do it on their own they just can't i see solo practitioners try to do it on their own without a paralegal and their stuff's jacked up i mean it's just it's the reality and and you know they may not think so or they may not want to hire one or whatever but it shows in their work because they're doing too much and with very little time and with very large caseloads so paralegals are a necessary position and role in this JAG world. And um, I think if we recognize that more as paralegals, maybe it would make us appreciate our jobs a little bit more. But again, senior leadership should stress that. Like, I, again, I, I tell my paralegals all the time, I'm like, this, this ship wouldn't go without y'all. It just would mm -hmm. not, it would not float. So, yeah. So it's just inter interesting that you mentioned that you, what you tell your paralegals and this in your in your uh, civilian practice. Yes, in in my civilian practice, I I mean, and you know, I, I was a civilian paralegal too before I became a lawyer. So um, I know more than most people what it's like. Number one, being a paralegal and and the true hours and exhaustion and vicarious trauma. Like I I get that on a wholehearted level, but also. I, I know how important the job is because as a paralegal, I mean, I worked in many different types of law offices and realized like, oh man, <laughs> this is like, like heavy lies the crown for real. I mean, this is a really important job. It's not, it's not just data entry. Like mm -hmm. what par military paralegals do is way more than what civilian paralegals do. So I have a serious respect for military paralegals, because they kind of honestly operate like associate attorneys as far as the amount of work that they do um, and the kind of work that they do. But even on the civilian side, I mean, my paralegals know I, I am constantly, every day when I get out the door, thank you for what you did today. Like, thank you so much for the sacrifices you made today, because I know that they took the brunt of the client's tears or you know the clients being angry, um, they were the ones who take the message and have to listen to it and and say, look, you know, Miss Fisher can't call you right now. She's in court. Again, she's in court. She can't talk to you right now. I mean, they're the ones taking the brunt and of everything that's going on, and they deserve 
to be thanked each and every day. And, and I know that, God, there's going to be some Jags and attorneys that probably watch this <laughs> and are like, whatever. But a lot of them don't understand because they've never done it before. And I did it for, for nine years. So I do understand, um, even in the guard capacity. I mean, there's, there's, yeah, stuff, stuff hits the fan in the guard. A lot of mm -hmm. people don't think so, but things definitely hit the fan. You know, you might work late, work late hours or whatever. Um, but I just, I think that's really important to make people feel appreciated for the sacrifices they make and paralegals make significant sacrifices. Anytime I go do AT days at an active duty base, I'm not going to lie. Like sometimes I'm like, I don't know that I could have ever been an active duty paralegal. I just, it, and I just know myself. I just don't know that that's something that a sacrifice that I could have made at the time, you know, between 21 and 24 that, I mean, it's a lot like active duty paralegals do a lot <laughs> right. and they're very, very late and not for extra pay. So we're in the civilian world, you might be getting overtime or you may, you may be getting paid per billable hour. So it's, it's just totally different. And it's a sacrifice that people need to, to understand um, is made without getting officer pay, is made without getting overtime pay. And we just need to be appreciative of their sacrifices. Yeah, for sure. Talk to me a little bit about that contrast then between, you know, like in your civilian practice and how paralegals operate there. And then from what your experience, from what you've seen um, in the military. So um, paralegals in the military, and I really realized this in seven level school, even if you have a JAG on the active duty side or in the reserve side too, that would prefer a paralegal not to do any of the drafting, we are trained to do the drafting. I mean, when you go to seven level school, as you know, like we're, we're doing some complex memos of law, some complex briefings, some complex um, pleadings even. And although the AFIs kind of lay out most of it, many of those legal reviews take creativity and take significant attention to detail and take a significant amount of logic before they ever get to the JAG. And when I was in seven level school, I thought this is kind of like 1L legal research and writing, like first year law school legal research and writing. I mean, th that class to me was very similar to that. And it was an, honestly, I thought this is a nice refresher. As someone who had been practicing for three years at the time, I thought, wow, this is like getting another legal research and writing in law school class, except it's in a much more shortened format. So the difference I would say, because, you know, we do as paralegals at our unit, we certainly do all the first drafts of legal reviews. And so I think that military paralegals do much more drafting and much more research than civilian paralegals do. Because most civilian paralegals are kind of serving as more of like a receptionist secretarial role um, in that, you know, they're answering phones, making copies, taking messages, e-filing pleadings or discovery you know, sending discovery out to opposing counsel. I mean, they're doing more of the administrative type stuff and less of the, I need to come up with an argument to put in this legal review and I need to match the law up with my reasoning in my legal review before I even send it to the JAG. That rarely happens in the civilian world. And so that's why I say like, Military paralegals, well, specifically Air Force, are coming out with a wealth of knowledge that can be transferred over to a significant civilian paralegal job, potentially making significant money, depending on where you're located. And I mean, not only paralegal positions, but like case manager positions and uh, that don't require a law degree. So I don't know. I just... It's, it's very different. Now, of course, there are civilian paralegals that do draft. I mean, I, I've got one that, you know, she's been doing this a really long time. I can ask her to bust out some discovery. She can bust the discovery out. You know, she can uh, bust out an initial pleading or petition. But, I mean, you know, we never require that our paralegals do any research. Like, the associate attorneys would do that. Like, the junior JAG equivalent would do that. Whereas in the military, like, 
I mean, we got to know how to use Lexus because you never know if someone's going to be like, pull this, pull this AFI. Like that happens all the time where we have to pull an AFI, match it up with the reasoning in our legal review and quote the law. And so that's in a military paralegal's daily job duty, depending on where they've got you in the office. So the other thing that's interesting is um, will drafting. So I know now PAC has, this is what I've heard anyway, they're increasing into 12 weeks so that they can incorporate will drafting for three levels, which it should have always probably been that way. I mean, yes. So anyway, I mean, that kind of stuff, the, the complex will drafting that we do in the military, I wouldn't say that paralegals are necessarily doing that on the civilian side. It's more so um, paralegals are just kind of taking whatever names the lawyer says and plugging it into the document. And I know that DL Wills is like a plug and play too, but as a military paralegal, we may actually have a conversation with the client about what per stirpes and per capita means. Like a civilian paralegal is not having that conversation necessarily with the client. Um, and I'll, even though we're doing it all under the supervision of attorneys, military paralegals are trained to be able to draft wills that sometimes have complex language and getting that to the JAG to a, a point where the JAG may only have to look at it and say, hey, this looks good. Just change this little thing here and it's good to go. I mean, so I would say that's the contrast. That's the difference is the military paralegals have much more complex job duties that are similar to an associate, a civilian associate attorney, in my opinion. And again, that's just in, just in my opinion. Right. All right. No, we are, you're absolutely right. We are trained to be super paralegal. Like we, like <laughs> we are trained really well. Um, unfortunately, I just don't, I don't know. Cause I haven't really seen him much, how he's been translating into actual legal offices, right? Cause we are trained on proof analysis drafting. I'm not sure how many offices have paralegals doing proof analysis. Uh, we're training motion drafting. I'm not, uh, I don't know. I don't, but <laughs> I, yeah. I don't think it's that many that has paralegals. Nope. Well, what's, what's interesting is I think that I, I think most paralegals would find that their quality of life <laughs> uh, goes up significantly once they get into a paralegal civilian career, because you're right. I don't know of many paralegals that are actually busting out memos. Okay. Like, honestly, I mean, most associates are doing memos their first one and two years into the job. Um, that is not something that you would see a paralegal do in the civilian world. And so I think it would kind of be like a culture shock to leave the military paralegal career field, go into the civilian paralegal career field and be like, I am bored to death, potentially. <laughs> and of course, like there's always the option that you go to law school, right? And, you know, go into this oversaturated, underpaid market of law. But, um, you know, some people may look at it and be like, Dude, my quality of life has gone up significantly. I mean, you may really be going in at nine and getting off at five right. in the civilian. Right. That is a possibility. And you may be doing nothing but preparing retainer agreements, you know, uh, e-filing some stuff, right. making sure hard files are kept, if they even have hard files, uploading documents. I, I mean, you know, it may be just very uh, minor stuff that you're doing as a civilian paralegal. Whereas in the military, like paralegals actually really do have to think. And I'm not saying civilian paralegals don't have to think. It's just, it's a different culture. And you're right. Military paralegals are expected to be super paralegals. And they are expected to, even if you're not going to be doing this, you need to know how to do it. I mean, just to get through PCC, I was really impressed by the amount of work and training that we got uh on how to do certain things i mean the writing and research portions alone serious emphasis on research research and writing things that may not convert to the civilian side because they may not even expect you to do that stuff uh but again 
that may work to many people's advantage because they may say, you know, I spent 10 years slaving away, you know, as a military paralegal. And now I kind of get to sit back and get off at five o'clock and go home and make, you know, great money. Right. So it's good to know. It's also good because, again, some people are going to get out and go to law school. I mean, or some people are going to go to law school while they're in, like I did. So, you know, it gives you a leg up. I, I will say that. And, and I know that I'm not trying to encourage all paralegals to become attorneys or whatever. Although if that's what you want to do, that's what's up. But I will say that my paralegal experience in the military significantly contributed to my success. Number one, in law school. Um, and number two, as a practicing attorney, as, as a writer, as a researcher, um, it's it, without a doubt directly contributed to my success as an attorney. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the more that you seek out to do the, you know, the more marketable you're going to be the training alone, the training alone that you can cite from PAC and PCC. Um, and you can throw that in the interview, you know, that like you're trying to have with a, you know, as a civilian paralegal, people will be impressed. But if you can also say that, oh, not only did we get training on that, but I've also, you know, I also did a lot of it on my, uh, at my duty station, then that's going to stand out. So it's just, you know, those things about taking advantage. And that's the great thing about in the legal offices, no one's going to tell a paralegal, oh, no, 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 don't do a proof analysis if they want to do it, right? Yeah. If, if they go and tell an attorney, hey, don't worry about that. I'm going to try to get a hack at that proof analysis. The attorney's going to be like, knock yourself out, right? Go ahead and do it. And you get that experience. Um, yeah. So, and that's the other thing, but a lot of us just don't want to take that, um, that challenge or that opportunity, like even discharge boards, you know, like that, it, that paralegals can be second chair on a discharge board and like, you know, actually litigate. That's awesome. You know, that's awesome experience. And you can, you can tell that um the potential employers that's amazing yeah i can tell you now i mean we do significant interviews on the civilian end for paralegals and and we take it very seriously just as important as we do lawyers because thankfully i do have a boss that knows the value of a, of a good paralegal um but i will say you know when we see military like on on the resume it holds weight not just because we're in alabama <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, whatever. But anyway, <laughs> uh, but also because, like, we know that there's a certain level of uh, bearings that in, in this workforce, you know, in, in this career field, yeah, you, bearing is important. Um, but also, if, if I saw, like, a military paralegal come through and, and try to become a civilian paralegal, I would hop on that without a doubt. I mean, that's invaluable training and experience that um you just don't really get anywhere else and i really do mean that like you're probably not getting that anywhere else that kind of experience so i know that some people are like oh i don't think that civilians will be impressed with my or attorneys will be impressed with my my military paralegal experience i disagree and and i can tell you right now like if i had someone walk through our door with military paralegal experience like it, without question that would be a huge thing for me because I just know like the amount of training we get and the amount of work opportunities we have. Um, the and professionalism. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like they may have a writing sample, you know, that's crazy. Like to think that like a paralegal would have a writing sample. That's that, mm -hmm. that's possible. Now it may be signed by the JAG, but you know, I, I know that if they say, look, I did the first stab at this and you know, whatever, I know it's probably their work. So anyway, I, I, I just think that people have to think about long-term too. And you're not always going to be in the military. This is a great career field to stay in. From the guard perspective, it's a great career field to have because you actually have to have, you don't have to have a civilian career. I mean, you could be a guard bum as they call it, but technically, you know, most people are going to have a civilian career and being able to say, I'm a part-time military paralegal really does translate to employers. Now, of course, you're going to have some employers that just don't want military people at their job. That's just, you know, that's separate from you being a paralegal. But um, I think that it shows a significant amount of detail and attention to detail and experience that a civilian employer would be looking for.
Oh, you're fine. I can still see you. Well, there on, we on, go. on this other one. Yeah, this other one is like, oh, heating up or whatever reason. <laughs> okay. Um. So what's next for you, ma'am? Like, do are you are you planning to stay in the guard long term as an attorney? Yes. Um. Yeah. I mean, I had decided once I hit eight years because I had a, a four year enlistment after my six years were up. So in the guard, you enlist for six years. I don't know if it's the same for active duty. And then after that, you can do four years thereafter. So I did the four. I would have been coming up on the four next year, but I commissioned beforehand. But once I hit eight, I was like, dude, I'm in for 20. Like, especially once I learned about retirement points, because I'm debt free as of this year. So like, it's really important for me to have, you know, as much retirement as possible. Cause I'm not trying to work on my life and I I'm going to do the 20. I mean, you know, I'm, and, and I'm not just going to be coming to drill once a month, you know, two weeks of AT out of the year and a quad tour every four years. I mean, I intend to, to do my 20 and to work as many days as I possibly can to help benefit my unit um, and to get as much experience and training as possible. Because even to this day, I mean, when I go do annual training at another base, I learn invaluable skills and information that still translate to my job as an attorney in the civilian world. So I'm excited to do it. Um, I don't know what that entails or what that even looks like when I go on active duty bases anymore. I'm so used to doing it as a paralegal, but I'm excited about that. Hoping one day to be able to deploy. I mean, one thing about the Guard is, is a paralegal or really any legal in the Guard, you don't deploy that often. I mean, in Illinois, we had the opportunity to go to Guam or we could, you know, if the legal office would let us go, we got to go. So, you know, for example, what you get to do in the Guard is if your unit is deploying and you call the legal office where they're deploying and say, hey, do y'all need some folks for two weeks? If the funding's there, you can go, you can just hop on the plane with everybody else. So, and, you know, get off at three o'clock and go to the beach. I mean, you know, you just, there's just so many opportunities. And I never did get to do that because I was always in law school or, you know, working a, a civilian career that I just, you know, when you first start as an attorney, you really can't take that many days off to be able to do that. But um, my hope is to, you know, maybe get some deployments in and, and I, it doesn't really matter where they are. I, I want that experience. I feel like I'm, I'm ready for that. Um, finish out my 20, continue busting my butt as a civilian attorney. And uh, I'm just really excited. <laughs> I don't know. This is the first time I've ever, like in my life that I've ever felt like, wow, like the future's so wide open. I mean, right. there's just so many opportunities for me at this point. Uh, and, and I went from a place where I just never thought I was going to get to this point. So. Mm. Anyway, I'm, I'm really excited about my military career and my civilian career and uh, just like being open to whatever comes my way, whatever opportunities come my way. And I mean, this this year was a great opportunity to be able to just share my experience and what I've learned over the last nine years. Um, and I just want to thank you again for for doing this and for asking me to be on on the show, because. I love talking about this stuff with other paralegals and if anybody ever wants to reach out um, and just talk about or need some encouragement to stay in the field, you know, just, just reach out to me. I, I would love to talk about it for sure. That's awesome. That's great. And thank you really for, for joining us and, and agreeing to do this. Um, your story, you know, I found your story inspiring. I'm sure others will as well. Um, just all the things that you were able to accomplish. Um, and you know where you are so at the very least people can can see and understand that there's a path and that is doable right and if you put in the work um and if you're you know smart about how you go about you know getting there um anyone you know that can happen to anyone you know regardless of where you are the regardless of where you come from or regardless of even your you know your income or, or whatever the case may be um background whatever so yeah no that's it's truly awesome and i definitely appreciate you sharing your uh your story and your experience with us absolutely thank you for for having me on and 
Yeah, I, I hope we cross paths again. I'm sure we will. You know, it's a small Air Force world, but especially in, in the JAG world. And I always look forward to, you know, just trainings and going to the JAG school and seeing people. Some of my most lifelong friends have been made at, at the JAG school for different trainings or courses or whatever. So, yeah, I just want to encourage people to stick with this and and encourage people to join the Guard. We're looking for a paralegal. That's I mean, right. shake a hug. We are looking <laughs> 17th air refueling wing if you want to apply and, and go guard if, if anyone sees this um hey it's it's bright blues over here we love it so anyway that's that's my last shameless plug of of this session <laughs> that's awesome yeah no and it's 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 a good one you know anyone who's considering that they can do that so you mentioned uh, in january then you'll be at jsoc yeah, well, I'll be hopefully going to OTS in October of this year. And then in February, okay. I will February JSOC class and hopefully be done in April of next year. And then, you know, just going forward from there. But um, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a different change because I have loved to be in a paralegal, especially the last three years. It's, it's been really enjoyable. And my best, 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 best friends are paralegals. Um, and I don't know, it'll be interesting, but I think I provide like a different mindset than most Jags uh, because I've done both. Right. And I appreciate this career field so much. And uh, I think that's something that's probably needed um, is, is to make paralegals feel as valued as they should feel. That's really important to me. So I'm, I'm excited to, to provide a different maybe aspect um, of leadership down the road. Awesome. Well, thank you again, ma'am. Uh, this was awesome. And I'm sure we will, uh, we'll cross paths again. Like you said, it, the career field is super small. So I'll see you soon somewhere. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. You, sir. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.